Hello everyone, happy Tuesday, and welcome to Talk About It Tuesday. I'm Tosca DiMatteo, founder of Tosca Coaching and Consulting, and I'm super excited to have you on today to speak with Melanie Graham, my coaching training colleague, um, and she's a DEI expert. Uh, she lives out in San Francisco doing awesome work, and here she is now. I'm going to bring her on. Let's do it! <laughs> Yeah. Wow. It's like, I can't believe like we're around the corner from April. This is not so. And let's just, uh, yeah. Hey, Mel. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, Look at you looking fabulous. Wow. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am good. Just jumbling the phone around a little bit. Hey, you know, it's all, it's all natural. It's all organic. Whatevs. I'm saying, I'm saying. We, we got we got a good crew already. I love it. Claire, essentially KT, Mojica oh. Girl. Mojica, if I'm saying that right, Mojica Girl. Mojica. We're about to yeah. uh, turn it. We are. We're going to break it down. We're going to be like, we're going to be like DJ Nice at the beginning of like quarantine and stuff. Like 100,000, you know, people in this room. Um, Or maybe 10. Uh <laughs> We'll take it all. We will take it all. Well, listen, I, first of all, Mel, let me just say that I am like so honored and privileged to have you on the show. Um, you know, not just because you're my friend and I know how amazing you are and beautiful you are inside and out, but also because you do amazing work in this world. And, and also I'm excited to have you on because this topic of comebacks just is so important, I think, for people to hear the journey through darkness and getting to the other side. And, you know, this platform is is all about, you know, people hearing the messy middle um, because uh, I think it helps people realize that there's a way. Um, so I just want to say thank you again for your time. And I'm excited to have you here. I I am excited to be here and I don't know supporting this I've been watching you do this for a while and have been so impressed and so like you feature some of the most talented people out there like women of color you talk about so many great issues mm -hmm. it, it's just really empowering and uplifting and I'm just glad to be a part of your journey cuz you mm -hmm. know I Man, regardless and this is I think this is huge and I I'm just in awe to see you like just blow up so this is dope and I'm I mean this is this is a big deal for me this is great oh my god oh well thank you so much it means so much to you know to hear I know you've been watching you know from the beginning and it's exciting to have Claire and I'll look at and and Michael here who are alum on the show so this is a feels like reunion-esque um and <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, and I just let's start off by helping the audience learn a little bit more about you, like where you come from, like what you're all about, what you're passionate about and why we're talking about comebacks today. Yeah, well, I, I moved to New York about six years ago, about about six years ago. I've always worked in public health, sexual health. Uh, doing organizational development. Um, I'm a social worker, a clinical social worker by trade. Um, so I, I've been doing this work for about 20 years and well, maybe 21. Um, uh, I started when I was like 12. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I hit a point in my career when I went to New York, where it was really great. It was exciting. It was fun. I had just moved from DC. It was, it was, it was live. Um, but as far as like, you know, hitting, like hitting a wall career wise, I felt I wanted to do so much more. I was a, in a, like a toxic environment. I was just like, I couldn't find my way out. And so the last like two and a half years were, were hard like you know it made me recognize like how much of my professional identity is my true identity and i don't know if that's great but it, it was my reality and the time that i was having that was just so difficult at that 
point in my career, um, it just, it, it floored me. It's like, I just hit like, just, just a low point. Like I, I don't think that in my life I had ever been so depressed. I could not, I could not find my way out. And that for me was absolutely like frightening that I could not control like my own narrative. It was, it was like, I was trapped and all I wanted to do was do work that made me feel great. I wanted to just help people. I just wanted to be around colleagues that, you know, empowered me that I could empower. And it, it just, it was, it just wasn't, it wasn't happening. Um, it wasn't happening until I got recruited to do the work that I'm doing now, which is uh, diversity and inclusion at, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, which is a huge, uh, one of the first like HIV organizations uh, based uh, obviously in San Francisco. And to intertwine like doing work in HIV and doing race work, which both are like my mm -hmm. passion, developed like the perfect job. Mm -hmm. So that, that like pulled me out and I was able to make my comeback. But I will have to say, before that, when I was feeling like at my most like stuck, I, I had to create my own, my own experience. And so I started, uh, I started my own business. This is while all still working in the same uh, environment. And it's called Social Equity Lab. And essentially what we do is consulting uh, with nonprofits, for profits, corporate startups, startups seem to be, you know, popular venture capital orgs, like all that type of work just around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, being at a low point and just kind of creating the opportunity started to pull me out of it. You know what I mean? I recognized that if I didn't create my own journey, it, it wasn't going to come. Mm. <laughs> and so that's kind of how we got here. And so this is great to come full circle. Wow. And I'm just like, I'm just, there's so much in there that I want to talk about. And the thing that's like really sticking out for me right now is like, how the hell do you create your own company while in the depths of, like, how do you do that? You know what, that, that is such a good question because it was, it was the only thing that I could do because mm -hmm. I couldn't, there wasn't anything anybody could do. Like, I think a lot of people are like, you know, you were super depressed, you were super down, like, what could I have done? And mm. honestly, nothing like, all I needed was, was work that made me feel like I had a purpose, like on this planet. Mm. And unless that was happening, there was nothing that anybody could do. And so I realized that mm. I'm gonna have to do this. And so, you know, when you're, at least when I was depressed, and just feeling super low, it feels like, you know, I'm just carrying all this weight, like carrying baggage, right? Emotional mm -hmm. baggage. And I'm not gonna lie, it was hard. It was super hard, um, uh, but it was all well worth it. So mm -hmm. I think what allowed me and empowered me to do that was every day that I woke up and went to work and like, like would work on this on the side, it was like taking vitamins, like, mm -hmm. okay, I feel a little bit better. Like I, I just got my LLC or I just had a meeting with a great client, or I got good friends that wanna be my partner. And every day that there would be progress, I would, I would feel like a little bit better. And so that was my drive. And then I would be like, okay, if this is what makes me feel better, it just really, it just really made me go hard. So it's just like mm -hmm. LLC, website, uh like meetings and it was just me doing whatever i had to do to fill myself back up mm. and it helped thank god um and i think doing that is what positioned me for my my current job so i still obviously have my business and have the autonomy to still do that i have great partners um but i also you know feel good and valued at the current work that i do so yeah, it was it was quite a ride. Still a ride. Double win, double win. And I love that you work at a place that's like that's like encouraging um, the side hustle and that work and like 
that's awesome. Like, awesome. Right. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting, right, because, you know, as a career coach, you know, certainly one of the things that, that I think happens and certainly was a part of my journey as well is, like, is that we tie ourselves up so much, our identity with work, Right. Um, and there's different, you know, people have different thoughts. Some people feel like work is a means to the end and they just want to make the paycheck and go home and, the, and, and they find their purpose elsewhere, right? In the community work or in their families or whatever. But what I'm hearing from you is that it's not necessarily that work was your identity, but that, but that living a purpose-filled life of service was part of how you um, – I don't know, saw your value or your worth or what, what have you. So, yeah. So I'm curious if your drive to do, you know, to start your own business at a time where you were in a toxic environment, was it about feeling worth or what, or was it like, was it something else or was it a combination of thing? I just, I'm just curious to get underneath. Well, that's good. And to which, by the way, one of my business partners just joined. His, his name is Brown and Tan. Uh, that's his handle. His name is Michael Diaz. Uh, he works with Social Equity Lab. He's dope. He's like a brilliant, brilliant trainer, uh, consultant. He's he's on a completely different level. So just shouting him out. Um, awesome. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, Brown and Tan. Michael. <laughs> um, you know, it was both. It, 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 it filled me up because I needed that. And I probably don't have the healthiest boundary between work and like my personal life um, because work is a lot of my personal life because I, I, I just feel so much purpose in, in supporting people and so, you know, supporting people to meet their, to meet their goals and to, for them to feel important and for them to feel like the work that they're doing is meaningful. It just brings me life and, and, and it always have. And I, I have to say, like, I've always gotten slack, like, uh, from people who manage me and just colleagues, like, you need to, you know, have a better balance. You need to have work life, mm. you know, all this. And I'm just like, I mean, making the work that I do is like, that. that is my balance. But I, I do know I could probably be a little bit better. But yeah, to answer your question, it really was both, you know, mm. it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think it's, you know, the word balance is always like, you know, interesting. I think to me, it's, it's like, it's about integration. Like, mm -hmm. are you able to integrate your life in a way that feels good for you? Because yeah. balance indicates they're supposed to, you know, it's supposed to look a certain way. Like mm -hmm. there's, I don't know, like 50% over here, 50% over here. I don't know. Um, but what I hear is that, that the work that you do is just such an integral part of how you live your life. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a, you know, that's an interesting way to, to like reframe it, like from mm -hmm. it's being like integrated versus like balance. And for me, that's just my reality. You know what I mean? Cause it's like, I don't even know if I know how to, I, it's been a struggle all this whole time. And I get something out of integrating what I do for a living in, in my life. When I look at like my friend group, it's like a lot of my close friends are who I met from the work that I do or that we do. And these are people like super close to me, like that I would look at as family and, and things like that. So you definitely, I mean, I appreciate the reframe because uh, that's real. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, it, it begs the question, you know, for anybody watching or evaluating, like, you know, are they, are they living in a healthy ba balance slash integrated life? And it's like, well, are, is what you're doing, like, do you feel depleted at the end of the day? Like, do you feel filled up? Like, cause I think there's questions like that where it's like, if you feel filled up because you just spent, you know, 10 hours of your day doing work that you love, then like, yeah, you know, you know, I think this is where it does get a little scary and where I learned my lessons is when I was in such a toxic workspace that mm -hmm. I couldn't control, it did feel depleted. It, it did. I took a huge emotional hit. Like mm -hmm. I, I literally felt 
physically beat down. Like it was awful. I, I think I scared people very close to me who've known me a long time, who've never seen me in that space. Mm. And for me, that did make me recognize like, like I gotta keep doing what I'm doing, but I have to do it different. I, mm. cause I don't know that I can change, but I, I have to, I have to do it different because I can't, I, I, I can't take a hit like that again. Mm -hmm. And I need to be in control of my narrative and my journey. And, and so when I look back and I'm still in the space of healing, when I look back, I'm like, how do I do that? And I, to this day, you know, I talk about this with my therapist. I'm like, I still don't even really know how I'm hoping to like better understand and like figure out how to have a healthy boundary like that. So I don't, you know, hit that space again. And, and I have to be honest, I'm, it's like, it's something that I, I am seeking to, to figure out, you know, it's scary, but you know, I'm here for it. Yes. I, 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 I definitely identify with that too. You know, doing, doing work in service of others. Um, it can take up a lot of energy and time if I let it versus finding other ways to fill my cup, other ways to just be without having to do and still feel I'm worthy of just being. I don't have to do. Um, so I, I totally get that journey. And I think what I love that you said about all that, right, because we're talking about comebacks today. And I love what you said is like you're still healing. Like you were in this toxic environment. And it's like that work isn't just now that you're, you know, in this different space, it doesn't mean there's not lingering you know shit going on that needs healing and I think that's just so true and just to honor that I think is great because it's like it's a process oh for sure it's like yeah I would be silly to not think I'm still in a space of uh like I said the other day to a friend it's like listen I'm still fragile like I'm still trying to navigate this because right mm -hmm. now it's like I felt I've discovered and found such a happy space and a happy medium. Like I feel so valued and I, I, it's just kind of like brought me alive. It's weird. You know, it's, it's, I, I don't want it to end. Like I'm on this ride and I refuse to like get off. And so yes. I'm in now where it's like, how do I ensure that this ride does not stop and that I still can navigate like the natural things that come up like with work and you know the topic that I deal with like just doing like race stuff it's not it is e emotional especially mm -hmm. like right now like it's it's not easy and it, it is personal and it's an everyday conversation that larger society is having and misunderstand and mess up and 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 you know, it's, that's a lot, but, mm. um, I don't know. I'm just here for it. You know, mm. I just, I, it, I'm thriving on it and I, it just brings me life. Mm. I, I love to like dig into this because, well, there's a couple things I'm going to dig in. I definitely want to talk about toxic environments, um, a bit, but the other thing I want to talk about, because you, you know, when we were preparing for this conversation and as we were kind of like messaging it out, you know, part of what you said, part of your process, of coming out of the darkness was in doing race work. And I'd love to hear more about like what you meant by that. Um, especially now, especially when, gosh, there's triggers all over the damn place. Oh my um, God. Yeah, no, that it, it was, it was fascinating. Um, so, you know, I would say, you know, I, when it was work wise about a year and a half ago, it was just like super low point, just in an environment that was like, insane just super toxic super um disempowering not a, not a good place like really really saddening it was what i experienced professionally was something i've you know things i've never experienced before by colleagues by by leadership by just the day to day you know what i mean and so um you know fast forward into like all the murders that were happening last year and then also being isolated and, and made to sit still at home by myself mm. in harlem um where there's so many like um you know uh resistance and and great protests and things that were going on you know sitting in that space it just made me just really really um really lean into 
who I really am as a human being. And that was important because through feeling in my lowest point, I really lost who I was. I just didn't know who I was anymore. I was just so beat down. And, you know, going, watching like what was going on around me reminded me of like who I am, the impact that I have in doing race work, how I identify and how that's powerful. And also, you know, anger and hurt of being surrounded by like horrific racism and violence. And so that, that I was just laser focused. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do what I, I'm gonna do race work and I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna do it my brand and I'm gonna go hard. And what's inspiring me are the Breonna Taylors. It's, it's all these, you know, effed up, situations that I was going to look at and have it like empower me like looking at ancestors using their power and filling myself mm. up with like their energy and like going out to society and just doing my work and being super grounded in my black identity being a strong black woman not like cutting any corners when like meeting with clients and being able to build my business mm. and being like really um, I wouldn't even say radical because I don't, I don't think it's radical. I just think it was just so much and is so much just pride. And I think that that worked. And I think that that people around me, uh, particularly, you know, getting partners with my business and then also um, just getting work for my business, I think people felt it. They saw it. And even, you know, attracting the position that I have now, I think I was just and still am just uh, – my tolerance is, is super low for, you know, uh, inequities and I have the capacity to resist it and to shift culture in a way that um, I think is unique and which is driven a lot by my own personal racial experience. Um, so it's, it's interesting and it's, it's exciting, but like, you know, uh, the tragic events that had happened last year, it, it, it just, it built, it just continued to build my self-worth back. It, mm. It's weird because it was horrific, but there's just something about sitting still and watching all this blood around me and, and it just filling me up to just sit up, become empowered, dust off. And this is like, even before I, I was able to transition work-wise, I just focused in on my business and like, I, I hate what's happening and, this is what I can do about it. And I just, mm. I just dove in and went nuts and still am. So that's essentially wow. how it impacts. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know what, that, thank you for sharing. And you know, what I really take away from that is in the depths of the despair and, and the ugliness and the hate is like, I, what I'm hearing is like, this was your fire this was your fuel for your fire and your rage to to channel it into something good into mm -hmm. something that you felt good about yeah 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 because you know it, it was you know as as odd as it still sound it, it was my saving grace because it really it really brought me the motivation and drive and emotion to invest just in emotionally invest like in my business. So mm -hmm. the, the uh, kickback that I was not getting from my work, like not feeling empowered by anybody or just like, I was surrounded just by toxicity and just like really weird stuff. And just, it was a nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, I just had to like emotionally cut myself off and, you know, just really, you know, lean into like all the resistance that was happening around me. It just, I saw like, you know, I, I was just in the middle of it. I felt like I, I saw like all this stuff and, you know, being black, it's like, we already know what's happening. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm glad we got cell phones and we can record it and put it online. And like mm -hmm. social media is a platform to like really show people like what's really going on. But like as black folks, we know, and we've been known and we, we, this is something that we've always been aware of. And so being able to 
watch it and see it. It was not going to lie, traumatizing, but I just used that trauma and I just like really, uh, just, just really changed the script and really like used that to go to be like a go getter. It just kind of woke me up. Like Melanie, you got to snap out of this. You, there's work to do. You can do it. You got this. Uh, and so, and, and that's, that's essentially what I did. I just used it to just re-empower myself and to just mm. go hard. I'm wondering how, how you do this work um, and protect yourself. And I mean that in a way of how do you not get re-triggered? How do you not get triggered by everything? How do you not let it bring you down so that you can't do the work. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just curious, the tools that you've used. You know, I, that's such a great question. It, the, the reality is, is that I don't have it. It does trigger me and it does make me emotional. And that trigger and that emotion is what makes me really good at the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And so I don't necessarily like want to be protected from it. Like I can't, and it, that's a facade. Like mm -hmm. there's no way as a black woman that I, I witness or see racism and can protect myself from feeling hurt. Like mm -hmm. I'm hurt, it, it hurts, it's, I'm angry, I'm sad, I, I see it, but like, because my baseline is so healthy right now, it's like, I see that and all it does is make me more creative to, you know, design interventions to shift culture. It just makes me more strong to um, resist. It makes me more sophisticated in, um, you know, uh, empowering the team that works with me and uh you know partners and and um uh other organizations like with my personal business like it's 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 really interesting it it, it the trigger and the emotion it for me it in a strange way it turns me on it it puts me it makes me stronger it makes me a threat for real for real because it i can't protect myself and you know i'm not gonna lie there's sometimes i see stuff and i'm just like why <laughs> like why why is this white why, why am i the only one that sees this or why are, are are black folks the only one in this organization that see like what's happening is not okay um so you know there's sometimes i'm just like i i'm like okay this is frustrating but i have to say for the most part um and the role and the leadership that i'm in i'm really empowered to to steer the boat when it comes to culture and so um yeah, without feeling triggered and feeling emotional, I wouldn't be able to do it, to be quite honest. Mm. I, I fucking love that. I mean, like, part of my French people, but, like, it's like, you know, so we, we often run away from our rage and our anger or we, you know, we, we try to hide it or we don't acknowledge it. We don't allow ourselves to fully f feel it. Um, and yet I'm hearing you say you use this, you know, this trigger, this emotion, I'm using the word rage, you didn't use that, but like, and you're using that as the fuel, as the creative juice. Um, so you're channeling it in a healthy way. Yeah. Um, and, and it's like, I, I read somewhere recently, right? Like that rage fuels all creativity. It was just such an interesting, like concept. Your um, story, because I am, because it isn't raging. I mean, it's racism and it sucks. And you know, it, it, it's, it's not great. And it, it's, yeah. And I, and there's pressure. I have, I, I have the pressure to make change and um, yeah. So it, I need, I need some hardcore emotion. I need some rage in order to do it. So mm -hmm. yeah, when I see something that's not like equitable or there's just like systemic um, practices and policies, it's just like, you're going to need me enraged in order to undo and dismantle and disrupt that because uh once i get to that place it's inevitable that there will be change because like mm. that's how powerful my rage is in that space well and there, there, what i heard too and as you were sharing your story was that 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 you know these these situations that have been going on for forever um like almost and then most recently right it was so much where there's this bigger acknowledgement because people are seeing it it's like i felt like this emboldened you to stand more fully in your power to be like i am who i am f all y'all and this is what you're getting you're getting all of me and i'm doing it and it's like 
And I feel like because it empowered you, like you were even more powerful in the work that you did and how you showed up. Like, is that how you felt about it? Because that's how I'm like receiving it. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like putting a battery in my back. Like, like, mm -hmm. are you serious? Like, y'all want to talk about this stuff now? This is trending now. I'm like, okay, like, we're gonna go on a ride. Like, yeah, it just it made me stronger. Like all the all the horror that we saw last mm -hmm. year, so close, you know, to and it really hasn't stopped because now it's just the API community, right? It just which hurts me just as much as you know, seeing anybody of color being, um, being being hurt being being attacked. And, you know, for the intersection of just just race and the violence that's that's coming against you know people of color and then the place that you know our culture like american culture wants to be at right now which is trying to understand and figure it out is like all right if y'all are ready I, i've been ready for this like let's do it like you sure I'm, I'm gonna go hard like it, it's it's you know it, it, it's exactly how you described yes and and like I'm just, I just have, I feel like I need to ask this question, you know, um, when, you, you know, as part of the, you know, your business, Social Equity Lab, um, I'm curious what you do when, like, you're met with people that are like, you know, yeah, uh, what, like, when you're met with people that aren't ready, you know, when you're met with the resistance, when you're met with Per, you know, like all the bullshit, right? Angry black women, you know, like all, all those kinds of labels. And like they, when you get fired up, you know, I'm just and how do you navigate that? Like in the work, do you do you just decide these people aren't people I'm going to work with? Or do you lean in and say, let me work with where they they're at? You know, like how that's, do you discern? That's such a good question. And I think it's always circumstantial. But I you know, if I were to work where people are at, I don't know if I would get all the work done because a lot of people aren't at a place where they really want to do race work. Because I think what mm -hmm. folks have interpreted it to be is that I need to be less racist at work. And mm -hmm. that's not really what this is about. This is about in order for you to be less racist at work, you have to acknowledge interpersonally and internally that you might carry some real bias. And when I say might, you carry real <laughs> bias. Right. You are a racist. Let's awesome. just be clear. We're all racist. Yes. Now, what yes. are you going to do about it? <laughs> right. And that and start from there, yeah. um, we might have a fighting chance. But what I, in both works, in my business and even at work work, it's kind of like, it's not about showing up at work and not being racist. It's not that. I think that that's mm -hmm. such a huge like misconception. It's about mm -hmm. you really have to internally make a shift. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to do that, it's it's not going to sustain in the workplace. You can go to all the trainings that you want that your job requires you to go to. If you're still carrying these values, it's not sustainable that you will show up to work with your colleagues of color and, and act right. You're just not. It's not possible. And I think that that's a bit of a misconception because we're bringing it to work. And people are trained, like we were saying earlier, to keep work separate from your personal life, from your family. And the reality is, is that you can't do race work in, in like a tunnel or you can't mm -hmm. do it comfortably. Like, oh, you know, I... I, I think to myself, do people go back home and I wonder what they say? Like, do they go back home and are they like, yeah, I went to this training, so I got to make sure that I spend eight hours a day, like not being racist or not being biased. And it just doesn't work that way. And so when I met with that, you know, my thing in all parts of my life is just being transparent, direct and honest. And, you know, something that we practice is like really stating what's present. Mm -hmm. And so I, I call it out in a way that might not alienate folks immediately, but I'm going to make you uncomfortable. And I need you to be uncomfortable because unless there is that level of discomfort, there is no change. And yeah. so I, I need folks to trust me, to trust my partners, to trust my staff that you are going to experience discomfort. And that discomfort is part of dismantling 
the socialization of being born white into this society and, and trying to be better when it comes to race work and race relations. So yeah, it's- I love it. I'm like, I, I, I'm sorry, what were you say? I, I cut you off. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I'm just like, is this your tagline for your company? Like, we're gonna make you feel uncomfortable. Like, just um, get used to it. <laughs> my partners that are on the chat like yeah like I anyone who knows me well or who works close to you know it's discomfort is um, an indicator of change that's all yes. that is and so if you if you are comfortable mm -hmm. and you try to make life changes whether it's around race or whatever it's like you know if you're comfortable nothing's happening you're not doing anything nothing's happening it's a facade it's safety it's it's you know it's what we do naturally. It's like our bodies are just trying to protect ourselves. But the reality is, is that if you're really trying to make change, you need to get emotionally naked and feel vulnerable, mm. hurt, you know, just not good, not comfy. And until you have that feeling, you got to lean into it mm. to work. And so, yeah, it's, it can be tough because there are a lot of folks that just don't buy it. Also, racism is super expensive. <laughs> like, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, folks – they might feel that way, like emotionally, like, yeah, I want to shift the culture of my organization and I want to do this work and, you know, they don't want to pay for it. And it's mm. just like, yeah, this costs, like these fucked up attitudes, it costs you. Like, you want me to un help you undo this? Like, it's costly. And, and if it's not me, anyone doing this work, it, it needs to be compensated appropriately. And, and it's costly and, um, and it's worth it. And it's, it's the price, it's a part of the price to pay to, to make organizational change. Woo, yes, and the homegirl is like, preach, and I'm like, yes, preach, let's talk about it. We got Geraldine on, like I said, this is like a coach's reunion. Claire is, is, is loving that you're bringing coaching skills and bring awareness to what is pre present. I love that, too. And, at, like, I'm just like, so when are we going to work together? Like, when are we going to go and, like, go into these organizations and change the world together? I just, wow, I just, I love it. Um, and I love that, like, also in the work that I do, you know, like, and I do culture transformation stuff. And, you know, I, I certainly do not ever call myself a DEI expert by any stretch. Um, and I also believe that, like, you know, if you want to work with me, you got to be ready to do the fucking below the iceberg surface stuff, because that's not what I do. You know, if you want checklists and hour long workshops, call somebody else that feels comfortable giving you a half assed you know, thing that's not really going to transform anything. Um, and, and, and I'm just, I'm just like here supporting this notion of pay for the shit. Like mm -hmm. you have 400 years of racist beliefs stuck up in your culture and in our, you know, our bodies and you want to what you want to pay pennies on a dollar to, to, to undo this. Like, come on people. Like, where are you at? Like, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. But you know, but you want to put money into like the coffee machine in your, you know, in your, in your break room, which by the way, nobody's using right now. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so oh, I, I, I would love to, to also talk about um, toxic environments. Yeah. Right. And in and, 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 and kind of all respects, because you talk about toxic workplace environments and I'm talking about like toxic friendships too, like just toxic places like and, and because I always say and I don't know what your philosophy is, but I always say being in toxic situations is like it has to be a temporary situation because it is not sustainable, right? right? And you can build up strength and you can build up skill sets and ways to protect yourself and ways to cope, but it is not like a long-term strategy. We just, nobody's that, you know, resilience is not meant for that type of thing. So I am curious. Um, and I think it's hard for people to leave toxic situations. Yeah. So I'm curious your journey of recognizing toxicity, like was it really easy for you or did it take time to be like, holy shit, this is like horrible. Like how, how was that for you in your environments? Yeah, you know, I'll say the last toxic environment that I had that was like pretty, pretty bad. It was just the, the last work I did, like the last mm -hmm. job I had. It was, it was the most toxic I've ever experienced in my life. And frankly, I knew right away and, mm -hmm. You know, you know, work can be toxic, right? And I think what, 
you know, a way to resolve it is to leave, is to pivot. Um, I think where it got scary was that I recognized the toxicity and I couldn't, I couldn't find a way out of it. Mm. And, and then that, that was scary because, you know, I would consider myself well connected and, you know, good at the work I do. And so getting another job wasn't necessarily difficult in my past, but it wasn't working. It wasn't working in, 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 in New York, really anywhere. Cause it wasn't like I was just looking in New York. I was looking everywhere and, um, or it wasn't work that was, that would break the cycle of mm. what I was experiencing. And so I won't say I was picky at all, but I mean, I wasn't lowering my standards of the type of work I wanted to do. And so um, I knew right away and, and I, surviving that was hard. It was, mm. it, I, it was hard. And I have to tell you again, what contributed to really me surviving that and navigating that was quarantine. I know it sounds bizarre, but like quarantine, pulling me out of it, pulling me out of that space into like my own apartment, private, being alone mm -hmm. and, and away from it, like at least physically was very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, it was really helpful. And if it wasn't for that, I really don't know how, you know, how it would have ended to be honest with you. I, because I was in a lot of pain. I was in a lot of pain and I was starting to, you know, resist it because I started my business and that was feeling so good. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was being able to resist it, but I wasn't getting better. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was able to survive what I was enduring and what I was going through, but I wasn't uh, liberated from it. And so mm -hmm. it was just being, you know, having the time through quarantine and really focusing, uh, just being physically out of out of that space is, is is what helped it but it was scary so i don't even have like a rhyme or reason of how uh how i got out of that but um it was just real circumstance and uh i'm just thankful that you know it went the way that it did and what i knew to do was just to once i figured sitting there that like okay change isn't happening mm. <laughs> and uh, I had to face that. And so I'm like, how do I create my own experience? Mm. And so I, I, that's when it just gave me the courage and the goal just to start my own, my own work, mm. my own business and lean into that. And mm. that was that, that brought me out of it. Yeah. But that's how I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, like, I love this notion that you created your own experience, like you, you worked with what you had, which is your own agency and resource, right, to, the, the way I see that is you, you followed the breadcrumbs of joy to get through yeah. that, that difficult time, and I, you know, I think that's one of the pieces of advice I often give, which is like, do what brings you joy, Find that space. I don't care what it is, if it's coloring books or going for walks, but like when you're in the depths of despair, it's like, how do you find the breadcrumbs of joy? And then they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger until you find your way. And I just love essentially KT. Thanks for sharing. She says, I finally just left a toxic work environment. Thank you for this conversation today. So healing, so powerful. Thank you for bringing your full self. Thank you for bringing yourself here. Thank you for leaving a toxic environment. It's like, yeah. You know, the way that I see it is, well, there's a couple, there's a couple things. Number one, I wish there was a FU fund for anybody who's in toxic environments that, you know, we just, you just pull from the fund to make it through until the next thing. Um, but, <laughs> um, but also that, you know, to get creative, like, cause that's what you did, right? You got creative about how you can take control of your life, how you can, you can define, you know, what works for you um, while figuring out how to deal with the toxicity. Um, and it's like, it makes me think of like when I, I, I talk about this book a few times recently, but I, I read the book, um, The Sun Does Shine 
about a man incarcerated wrongly for 30 years on death row. And like w one of the tools that he used was visualization and imagination. He traveled the world in his mind, um, right? So that he could control his mind and where his thoughts were going. Um, and to me, it's like that's one tool in the toolbox of how do we, because we're talking about comebacks, right, of how do we get ourselves to a point, right, where we can, you know, and sometimes we need support to do that, right, therapy and all that stuff, but to get ourselves to a point where, where we can dream big again, where we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, where we can, you know, keep, keep going. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's really interesting because, you know, something that I would say to a colleague of mine when I was in a toxic space is I would always be like, just feels like, I feel like I'm incarcerated, like, mm -hmm. like, I'm in, like, like just locked up, right? And the reality is, and where I showed my resistance is that I might be stuck in this really effed up situation, but you have no control over mm -hmm. my you have no control of how powerful I really am and how good I really am and the leader that I am. You have, you'll never ever take that away. Mm. You can, you can like make my day to day a living hell. You can, you know, uh, demean me. You can turn on me. You can do all this stuff, but you will never ever take like the essence of who I am away from me like that. That's all me. And it's just about me being able to leverage that and, and, and doing what I need to do after I do that. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So when you describe that man, it's kind of like he was actually incarcerated. And he's like, you know what? You can lock me up, but you ain't about to take my, my mind. You ain't going to take my imagination or my creativity. It's impossible. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it, I, that's something that people can't take. That's something I realize now. Mm -hmm. And I had to go through like that you know, toxic and, and hurtful space in order to recognize that I, like, the essence of who I am is still there. Mm. You know, like, I might be feeling upset or sad or beat down, but like, they're yeah. beating down or I'm feeling beat down. And, and it's me, it's, it's still, it's still me. It's like, and I'm the shit. Like, so this is only going to go so far. You know what mm. I'm saying? And it just took a minute for me to recognize that again and to mm. come to terms with like, okay, this can only go so far. This only goes as far as I'll let it. And I just got to a place where I recognized, yeah, they can't take that. Like, yeah. And once I knew that I was good. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's, I, I love this message that you're sharing because I think that people feel like they've lost themselves, you know, when they're they they've gone through tough situations like you have and and to remember you're never lost you're always there it just maybe got covered you forgot you right but it's it's still there and i think the process and the way i see the process of healing is peeling all the layers and all the shit that's been dumped to say oh right oh right like my essence is still there. It's untouchable. Our essence is untouchable. Yeah. You know, yeah. So how do we come back to that and find ourselves again to, to get out of the darkness? Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't like to romanticize it because I, I remember being in a real low place, not, not finding my essence, not like not knowing who I was. Like it was to the point to where I needed to, I had, this was before we became on lockdown. I had planned a trip to visit my father's family and to visit um, like my childhood friends, like when I was like a little girl, just so I can get a reminder of where I came from mm. because it was gone. And I knew that I needed to do this in order to come back as a part of coming back. Like I need mm. to, I lost who that Melanie was like, I just lost it. And, and that's not cool. Cause these are people that know me or are a part of me. And I'm like, I, I gotta, I gotta go back. Mm -hmm. I gotta stop this, stop where I'm at and literally go back to people who knew me before I started my career, who knew me growing up poor in public housing, who knew me, uh, like 
who I am am. You know what I'm saying? And I had to just stop it and go back. And unfortunately, you know, the quarantine came and I couldn't leave. And so mm -hmm. I got a little scared, like, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to mm -hmm. take the trip. But, you know, <laughs> just me thinking that was enough for me to sit still mm -hmm. and just, just, just do what I have to do to uh, either wait this out or um, just focus on, on, on uh, other work. The, the narrative that I created. And mm -hmm. I, that's what I decided to do. And things came to me and, and that's where I ended up where I am now. So thankfully it worked out, but there was no rhyme or reason or no formula. It was kind of on accident. So uh, that's the part that kind of scares me because I, mm -hmm. I want to know how to do it just to flex it in the future in case I have to, you know? And uh, I'm in a healing space where I'm just still sorting that out, you know? Well, I, first of all, thank you for sharing, you know, that because, you know, I'm all about the real, real. I'm not about like glossing over like the shit, yeah. right? Like that's why we have these conversations. So we can be like, oh no, I had no fucking idea. I had to go back to the beginning. That's what, you know, um, so thank you. Yes. Um, and, and I'm not sure you're giving yourself enough credit for, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's like the universe was conspiring for you, and you were doing the work. Yeah, you were doing the work, and you created space and opportunities for yourself because there are plenty of people that were also forced to stay home, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they maybe didn't use that time right yeah. to go inward and do the healing and 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 find the way through. So. I just, you know, I'm going to call you out when you're not giving yourself enough credit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> um, so, so, gosh, I can't believe we're, you know, we're coming close to the, to the end. But I want to, I just want to ask you, what, what else do you want people to know about comebacks, about clawing your way, about, whether it's tips, advice, resources, like what do you want people to know about the comeback? Um, that it's just, it's, it's, it's just not over. Like something I would tell myself, like even mm -hmm. feeling low and knowing that although I didn't know what was ahead and at the time it didn't look great, I knew that I had a hard time believing that m my purpose was over. I knew mm -hmm. it wasn't. I, I, I knew in my heart it wasn't over and I just had to trust it and believe it. And I think what folks can do when they feel like they've hit this wall, whether it's in personal life or even in, in work life, doing race work, because it can take you there, is knowing it's, it's, not, it's not over. Like it seems like it's over and it feels like it's over, which is not great, but it's, it's just not because you're still here. So it's just, literally not over <laughs> you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I I think like truly believing that um it's only a matter of time before uh it, the picture looks much different mm. Mm. yeah yeah I love that I love that it makes me you know it it makes me think of and I don't know if this is part of your ph philosophy or approach to getting through tough times but like it just makes me think about living in the moment yeah, like this oh, this is the only moment we have, and this is it. And you're still here, and you're okay in this moment. I don't yeah. know if that's part of how you see it. I mean, it's something I've been telling myself now. Like Melanie, stay present because mm. that journey and it was real. And stay present with where you're at now. That's I always tell myself that because I'm mm. always trying to figure out what's next. And I, I don't I don't want to do that right now. I want to I want to live like in the present, like I want to be super present. Um, so yeah, that's real. I admittedly, it was hard to be present before because it, my what was present was painful. Mm. But I, just, I really just tried to understand to look around me recognize like what was going on, and know that this is this is a rough patch. And it's not cute. But it's gonna it's gonna end like mm. it has to because I'm still here. And I'm not going to, I can't, you know, I can't sit in this much longer. And so if it just means I go harder in my business and I'm going to do that, 
or if it means because I'm so focused I might attract a different opportunity then you know fingers crossed that happened too and so so yeah it, it can get real but yeah and you know I'm not the type that's like it's gonna sound like dreadful like hopeful like I don't I always think God when you start hoping it's not great because it's just like there's like <laughs> God, right? but like it, I really had to change the way that I thought you know, in order to survive where I was at and then be able to embrace where I am now. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, man. I mean, that's... I think there is, there's something to be said about, like, finding, like, finding your your truth in, in all the muckety muck. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and coming back to yourself over and over and over again, which is kind of a thread that I feel like has been through this whole conversation mm -hmm. in, in what, in, in, by any means necessary and getting creative. Cause it's like, you were going to come back to yourself by like going back home, but then you didn't have that option. And so you did it a whole nother way. Yeah, you know, um, and I think that's the thing. It's like, how do we when how do we see when a door is closed, another one is open, mm -hmm. you know, and if that one closes, there's another one that's open and you just keep looking for the next and the next. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and there was something that you said earlier, too, that I just want to come back to really quick, which, you, you know, in the very beginning, you were like, you know what, there was nothing anybody else could do. Because yeah. there may be people watching that maybe aren't in that space or haven't been in that space, but they know other people that are and they feel powerless and hopeless. And so, like, what would you say to those people who are desperately want to do something, um, but the reality is something else? Yeah, you know, I think just asking, just, you know, I was I was happy to know, even though I was surrounded work-wise by a lot of you know, toxic individuals, there were, what it did make me realize that I, I have to acknowledge here is that like, it also showcased the people that were there for me, even in that toxic mm -hmm. space, might have been a handful of people that, that were that cared about me. Actually, mm -hmm. I just saw one that was on here. Um, and, and that, uh, that was important for me to recognize. I couldn't just sit and shit and just be like, oh, everyone sucks. This is, this is terrible. Mm. I was also forced to recognize this person might not be able to help me get out of this, but the fact that I recognize that they're here and they're asking at a time where I am not well, I'm, I'm good. And I see them in a different light. And mm. I, I don't forget them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that that for me was powerful. Yeah, it's like what I'm hearing you say is just knowing that somebody's there and, and is seeing you and knows it and knows some sense of what you're going through was is enough to to give you some kind of for, comfort. Yeah, yeah, because I knew that there wasn't anything that they could do. And I also knew that although the time in which I was in sucked, I knew that I was gonna come out of it. I didn't know when and that that's that mm. was empowering and that was scary, but I knew it, it wasn't over. And so I knew when I got to a great place that this, the people that did like sprout up during this time, whether they knew it or not, I'll never forget. And I'll always mm -hmm. remember like who they were to me during that time. Mm -hmm. And, and that for me was, was enough. And I think I would have failed if I didn't acknowledge that at a really low place that there was nobody. Cause that's not true. There mm -hmm. were, and, and, I, I didn't want to not understand. And mm. so I, that, that was all they could do. And, you know, I'd be like, no, I'm good. You know, it's, it's, it's cool. But in the back of my head, I'm like, this is a real, a real ally. This is somebody who really cares about my well-being. Oh, wow. That's, uh, I, it's beautiful share. That's a beautiful share. Um, to, to just remind people to acknowledge that they aren't alone, that there is somebody <laughs> out there. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I guess um, 
you know, as we're wrapping here, what the, what the hell is next for Melanie Grant? Like, like you are just, I feel like you're sitting in such an amazing place. You're feeling fulfilled. You've got your side hustle. You've got your San Francisco AIDS Foundation, like badass, you know, job there, culture. And, and it's like the best title ever. I'm like, I want that title for myself. It's like, you're like a chief of talent and culture. Yeah, it's a good time. Yeah. So what else? Like, what's, what are you dreaming big about now? Other than like your hopefully TEDx talk. Okay, I'm totally projecting. Like, but I, I, I had that thought earlier when you were talking. I was like, this this girl is gonna do a TEDx talk. I know it. Like, I, bring it. Um, <laughs> is like stuff like this. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like now I'm in a place where I can talk and reflect about the experience that that I had that can hopefully support somebody who's in that space now or who's mm. come out of that space or who's about to go into that space. And, you know, I just want to leverage the experience and, and the feelings that I had to support somebody in case they're going through it mm. or to, you know, just to be there, you know, and then also just leaning into my, my, my business. I, I love that, that, that was a saving grace. So I'll never, you know, that'll always be important to me and, and just continue doing, you know, the work just just the race work and I, I love it and and you know just continue to, to just be brave you know because mm. it I it gets real and it's scary and mm. I'm just all I all I care about is protecting my space being brave and uh you know just you know being aware and present what a beautiful message and uh continue to be brave out there y'all do the work. Do the work. Uh, well, thank you so much, Melanie. Thank you for blessing us with your presence, for coming on this platform, for being brave, for talking about your journey. I like. I know that you've inspired so many already, let alone as this gets out into the world more. Um, it's just it, the, the realness, the vulnerability. I mean, that's you know, that's why I love you, girl. So I look forward to much more to come from you. Thank you, because you were one of those people that were always there for me, that were mm -hmm. always standing by. I, I mean, you you were significant in that time. So mm -hmm. please know that I you're blowing up, you're growing, you're just you're like a big deal. I'm your biggest fan, and I'm here to do this anytime you want to have this chat again. Like this is awesome. I appreciate yes. it. Yes. Oh, I appreciate you too. Thank you so much. And yes, let's do it again. Let's do All it again. All right. right. Love you, Bye. girl. Talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone, for joining now and later. Look forward to hearing your thoughts on this conversation, and ciao for now. Bye. Bye.